Hi. Hi. Today's lecture is on section 4.2 in the LOCK5 textbook. And this section introduces the concepts of randomization distributions and p-values. So the first important piece that you're going to learn in this lecture is about randomization distributions. You need to basically understand what we're assuming when we're creating them, why we're creating them, where they're centered, and how to use stat key in order to create them. Then the other important concept, which is the bigger and most important piece here, are p-values. Why do we use them? How to calculate them from a randomization distribution? How we interpret them? And how and the alternative hypothesis can affect them? So let's begin with an example. So we talked about this last time in class. Um, and the example was, suppose we are interested in studying whether there's an advantage to being the home team in baseball. A home field advantage would imply that there's a greater than 50% chance of winning at home. First, let's state the null and alternative hypotheses. So the, we'll write the null hypothesis H0. And we'll write the alternative is HA. And in order to write the null and alternative hypotheses, we first need to know our, our parameter. And as we discussed last time, in this case, our parameter is going to be the population proportion because we are interested in winning or not winning. And so that is a categorical variable. And categorical variables, we estimate proportions. So we've got a proportion over here and here. We know that the null hypothesis is always going to have an equal sign. And what is it going to equal? It's going to equal 50%, or as a proportion, 0 0.50. So we know the 0 0.50 is going to go down here. So all that's left to do is to figure out the sign. This, over here, we see that it says is greater than. So that means we're going to have a greater than sign. So we see that as of October 10th, home teams won 18 of the 33 games. What is our best estimate of the proportion of games a home team wins in the playoffs? So our best estimate, which is also our point estimate, is going to be p hat. That's going to equal the number of wins over the number of games. And that's going to equal 18 over 33. We can equal 0.545. So that's our best estimate of the proportion of games a home team wins in the playoffs. So you may be asking yourself, wait a minute, why is the sample proportion not 0 0.50? Well, there are two reasons why our sample proportion was 0.545 and not 0 0.50. And that is, one, that there truly is a home field advantage. In other words, teams at home are more likely to win games than the away team is. Or that the 0.545 is just different by 0 0.50 just by random chance. right? We talked about in with our bootstrapping distributions uh, that we can have variability and just random chance and random variation in our sample statistics. And so perhaps the fact that our sample proportion doesn't equal 0 0.50 is just by random chance alone and not that there is truly a home field advantage. Now, what we want to know is how do we know if we have enough evidence to rule out random chance? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And that brings us to the concept of a randomization distribution. So just as a quick reminder, um, a bootstrap distribution is used to help us understand how sample statistics can vary randomly from sample to sample. It estimates our sampling distribution and it estimates our standard error. But what we'd like to know is how do statistics vary from sample to sample? This is if the null hypothesis is true. Ignore these other bits of character up here. They don't really matter and are just an artifact of the way I created my notes. So how do statistics vary from sample to sample if the null hypothesis is true? And what was our null hypothesis? 
our null hypothesis was that there is no home field advantage. So we would like to know how likely it is for the home team to win 54.5% of their games if there truly is no home field advantage. And this brings us to the idea of a randomization distribution. So what we're going to do is we're going to simulate many samples, like 10,000 samples at least, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. And this is what's referred to as a randomization sample. For each one of those samples, we're going to calculate the sample statistic of interest. And that's known as our randomization statistic. We're going to save all of these statistics to create a randomization distribution. Our randomization distribution will be centered at the null hypothesis value, and it tells us the plausibility of our sample statistics given that the null hypothesis is true. So if we want to think about how we could use this information, well, what, we, what would be great to know is how likely would it be to observe a sample proportion of 0.545 given that there is no home field advantage, given that the population proportion equals 0 0.50. If it's unlikely, then that means that there is a home field advantage. If it's likely to observe that value, it means that it's uh, very unlikely that there's a home field advantage. So we can use this information to evaluate that. And that's what we're going to use a randomization distribution before, uh, uh, for. So this is somewhat similar to how we use a bootstrapping distribution in that we come up, we look at it to ascertain what our likely versus unlikely values for our sample statistic. And that's the same sort of way in which we're thinking about this here. Except what we're thinking about is how likely is it that we would obtain the sample statistic given that the null hypothesis is true. So in order to do that, we have to generate a distribution given that the null hypothesis is true. So how do we do that? Well, in this particular case, we can use a penny. So we know that there were 33 home games and we know that uh, the home team won 18 of them. So what we, what we had there is our, our sample proportion, right? 18 over 33, which we said was 0 0.545. To create a randomization distribution, and you could do this at home, you could flip a penny 33 times. And then you can record the number of heads and the number of tails. If we let the heads represent wins, then what we're really interested in is the proportion of those heads. And this is going to be called our randomization sample proportion. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to repeat this process 10,000 times. So what we're going to do is we're going to flip our penny 33 times, record the number of heads, record the number of tails. That's our randomization sample. We're going to calculate the proportion of heads, and that's our randomization sample proportion. And we're going to repeat this 10,000 times. Now, probably the thought in your in your head already of flipping a penny 33 times is already kind of an exhausting concept. So clearly, we don't want to repeat this 10,000 times. And we're going to use software, in, in particular StatKey, to do that. So the first thing you might be wondering is, well, how can we use a penny to do this? Now, if we remember, if we have a penny, right? We have a heads and we have a tails. How often, in the long run, would we expect heads to come up? What percent of the time? Well, we'd expect it to come up 50% of the time, which means that we would expect tails to come up 50% of the time. These things written as proportions are 0 0.50, and this written as a proportion is 0 0.50. So if we flip a penny, we're assuming that the true underlying population proportion is 0 0.50. So that means that would totally work. We could completely do this. And the reason we can do that in this case is because our null hypothesis value was that the population proportion equaled 0 0.50. So clearly, any distribution that we create based on that is going to be consistent with our null hypothesis. It's going to, it's going to, uh, 
it's going to be a distribution that is going to occur given that the null hypothesis is true. So what if we instead decided to define home field advantage as greater than 60% chance of winning at home? So that would effectively change that null hypothesis to P equals 0 0.60 and our alternative to P is greater than 0 0.60. Well, we can no longer use a penny, right? Because our penny, we expect to come up heads or tails 50% of the time, each one of them. Now, if we somehow found a unfair penny, one that could come up heads 60% of the time, then we could use a penny. But otherwise, we can't use a penny anymore. We could only use a penny in the situation where it's 0.5. Hopefully, that makes sense to you. And we're not going to use a penny, right? We're going to use software to do this. So how do we do this in StatKey? So I've got a series of screenshots here that will walk you through this. So the very first thing you need to do that you need to notice that's different about um, the randomization distributions, which are also referred to as randomization tests, is that you need to determine what your population parameter of interest is. So again, here we're looking for a, a test for a single proportion because our null was that p equals 0 0.50 and our alternative was that p is greater than 0 0.50. So you'll click that button. It'll bring you here. And then what you need to do is you need to click that edit data button because by default it has this data in here that is data corresponding to this dog matched with owner data set, which is not what we're interested in. And, and in the count, we're going to have add the number of wins. And then the sample size is going to be a number of games. So 18 divided by 33, that's our proportion. So in other words, that's our numerator. You divide those two things and you're going to get 0.545. You click OK. And now you see that information reflected right here in our original sample. And we just talked about how you could create a randomization distribution by flipping a penny. So what we're going to do is we're going to allow stat key to flip a penny 10,000 times. So we're going to click that generate 10, uh, 1,000 samples. And we're going to click that 10 times. And then when we do that, it looks like this. So we've got a nice bell-shaped randomization distribution. We see that it is centered at 0 0.500. And that is expected because our null hypothesis, which is specified here, is 0 0.05. Now, in the instance where our proportion is not 0 0.5, we're going to have to go in there and we're going to have to modify that. But in this case, we can just use the default. So it's bell-shaped. It's 0.5. This is all really interesting and helpful right now. So what we want to ask ourselves in order to use this before we formally introduce the concept of a p-value, is how likely or unlikely are these following values if there's no home field? So our original sample statistic is 0.545. How likely or unlikely is that value? So if we were to come over here, and we were to say it's like right here is where our, our value is, um, and actually it's probably probably this value here because of the fact that we're dealing with a, a value. Well, we can see, in fact, that that one particular value is very likely to occur. And then if we consider all the values that are even larger than that value, those are all very likely to occur. So that would mean that this is, in fact, a very likely outcome to observe. How about 0.8? How likely is that value to occur? Well, we don't even really see 0.8 on here, do we? This value right here is probably lower than 0 0.8. 0 0.8 is probably really like right here. So given that there's no home field advantage, and as a reminder, this is a randomization distribution that is created given that there is no home field advantage, given that the population proportion equals 0.5, that would be extremely unlikely to observe. Extremely unlikely. 0.545, very likely to occur. 
How about a 0 0.650? Well, that value is like right here, right? Well, that value looks to be a little bit less likely. Right? It's certainly less likely than 0 0.45, 0 0.45, but it's definitely more likely than 0 0.80. But how likely is that? We want a way in which we can quantify that. And just to make it clear too, because I'm not sure if I did when I was, when I was showing this, that this is the amount of variation we would expect in our sample statistics, given that there's no home field advantage. So it would be very likely that a home field team would win 0.45 um, of their games be very unlikely for them to win 0 0.80 and it would be somewhat intermediate for them to win 0 0.650 given that there's no home field advantage in other words given that these results just occurred by chance so what we would like to know is how unusual would a home team winning 54.5 percent of their games be if there was no home field advantage this introduces us to one of the most important and one of the most misunderstood concepts in statistics. This is the p-value. It is such a cr crucially important concept and it is so misunderstood. Um, and I suspect that many of you, when learning about this, will be very confused about it as well and will misinterpret it, and that's okay. Um, I have worked with many, many, many students, many graduate students, many faculty, who still misunderstand this concept. And so I would encourage you to, until you understand what the words mean, is pretty much to repeat it verbatim as it's written here. So the p-value says, given that the null hypothesis is true, the probability of observing a statistic as extreme or more than, uh, as extreme or more than that observed. So given that the null hypothesis is true, the probability of observing a statistic as extreme or more than that observed. In statistic, for the statistic over here, if you wanted to, you could also put in the word sample. That also works. The probability of observing a sample as extreme or more than that observed. That language is still the same. And later on, we'll be talking about test statistics. Right now, we're talking about sample statistics. And so that's sort of why I dropped off the first word there, the word sample. But really what we're talking about is the probability of observing a sample statistic as extreme or more than that observed given that the null hypothesis is true. So how do we use the randomization distribution to do this? We're gonna calculate the p-value by determining the proportion of the simulated statistics as extreme or more than the observed statistic. So how do we do this in stat key? Well, um, we're going to click right tail. And the reason for that is that we're interested in the values that are greater than 0 0.50, right? So we had a null hypothesis, which was that our, our population proportion is 0.5, and an alternative that it's greater than 0.5. So no home field, no advantage, advantage. So if we're trying to find values as extreme, we want to do a right tail because it has this greater than sign. So we know we want to go to the right. So when you click right tail, it shows this by default. But we need to do a couple of things. We first need to click on this button. And when you do, this dialog pops up. And what you want to put in here is your sample statistic. In this case, we want to put in p hat. In other situations, you're going to want to put in x bar or you're gonna to wanna to put in the differences between the p hats or the differences between the x bars or your correlation. But in this situation, we wanna put in p hat. We're gonna click the bottom down here. And we see that this is where 0.545 is. So right here in the very bottom, it shows us our sample proportion. And then right here, we see our p value. So it says that 36.8% of the sample statistics were as extreme or more than that uh, than 50, then 0.545. Let me say that one more time. This says that given that the null hypothesis is true, 36.8% of the sample statistics were greater than 
or equal to the value with which we observed, which was 0.545. So the best way to interpret it is like this, right down here below. Given that there's no home field advantage, given that H naught is true. That's what that first part is. H naught was that there's no home field advantage. H naught is going to be the, the null hypothesis. I'll call it H naught a lot. The probability of zamping, observing a sample proportion, this is our statistic, as extreme or more than that observed, which is 0.545, so this is our observed value, is, and that's our p-value right there, 0.368. So given that there is no home field advantage, the probability of observing a sample proportion as extreme or more than 0.545 is 0.368. In other words, 36.8% of the sample statistics would be as extreme or more extreme than what we have observed. So in fact, it's fairly likely that this would occur. Just thinking about it intuitively. You know, if 37% of the time we were likely to observe these results just by chance alone, that's a pretty high uh, probability. I mean, yeah. So let's, let's um, go back and think about, well, what impact does the alternative hypothesis have here? So does it impact the randomization distribution? The answer is no. Only the null hypothesis does. Does it impact calculating the p-value? The answer is yes. And what it does is it determines what we mean by saying we're, we want to look at values as extreme or more than that observed. In other words, it tells us what tails we want to use to calculate the p-value. So if our alternative hypothesis involves a less than sign, the p-value is the proportion of simulation statistics that are less than or equal to the observed statistic in the left tail. So if our randomization distribution looks like this, it's centered at our null hypothesis value. And let's say our p hat is over here. Our, our p value is going to be this area, corresponding to that area. It's going to be to the left of that. If it's greater than, has a greater than, it's called a right tail test. And it's the, the proportion of sim, uh, simulation statistics greater than or equal to the observed statistic. And that's going to be the right tail. So if we continue to just use that same p hat here, it would correspond to this. <clears throat> if it involves a not equal to sign called a two-tail test, then what we do is we look at the smaller tail or beyond. Um, we, we, excuse me, we find the proportion of simulated st statistics in the smaller tail at or beyond the observed statistic. And to find the p-value, what we're going to do is double that number. So, and if we're here like this, and here's our p-hat, if this value is 0 0.02, for example, that would be our p-value for the left tail test. Our p-value for the right tail test is going to be 0.98. The reason is that that whole area under there has to sum up to 1. And for the two-tailed test, it's going to be 0 0.02 times 2, which is 0 0.04. So the alternative hypothesis that basically is going to determine what tails you look in. So you may be asking yourself, Chris, why would I ever use a tail, a, a, a look at a look at a alternative hypothesis uh, based on um, and end up in sort of this situation where we're right here in number two, where my p-value could be monstrous. And the reason is that when you generate your alternative hypotheses, you do this before you collect data. In many times, the way we do this in class or how it might feel like is that, well, we've collected data and now we're going to construct an alternative hypothesis based on that. But the fact is, in some situations, you have directionalities that you expect. Like, for example, when we were talking about the eating disorder program, we would expect that the eating disorder program should reduce the number of eating disorder symptoms. And if that's the case, our alternative should be a less than sign. Now, 
maybe we think it's going to reduce the number of eating disorder symptoms, but maybe it's not going to reduce the way in which people feel about themselves. So, or, or maybe their body mass index, uh, which is a measure of your weight to your height ratio. So if we don't know what direction that's going to impact them, that they're going to, maybe they're going to have a smaller BMI or a greater BMI, we just expect the BMI might change. In that situation, we would use an alternative. Now, for you right now, it should be clear from the context of the problem what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, alternative hypothesis it is. And in many situations, just a matter of a lot of practice doing this. And you're going to be doing these over and over and over again for the rest of the semester. Now let's work through two examples. The first example looks at the effect of caffeine or naps on word recall. So a random sample of 24 adults were divided evenly into two groups and given a list of 24 words to memorize. During a break, one group took a 90 minute nap while the other group was given a caffeine pill. After the break, the number of words that the participants were able to recall was recorded. The mean number of words recalled for the sleep group was 15.2 and for the caffeine group, it was 12.2. Was there a difference in the conditions on word recall? So, first of all, what are the parameter and the statistic of interest here? So we want to know, is there a difference in the conditions on word control? So that difference should already have you thinking, I'm looking at a difference in means or a difference in proportions. Now you can see here that we have two sample means, so you should know we're dealing with a difference in means. Another way to know that we're looking at a difference in means is that we have a categorical variable, which is the condition they're in. So it's either caffeine or a nap. And we have a quantitative variable, which is the number of words they recalled. And so this class so far, we've talked about if you have a categorical variable and a quantitative variable, you're always dealing with a difference in means. So we know we're dealing with a difference in means. So what's our parameter? It's going to be, say, mu of sleep minus mu of caffeine. And our statistic of interest is going to be x bar of sleep minus x bar of condition. So what are the null and the alternative hypotheses here? Our null hypothesis is going to be that mu sub s minus mu sub c equals 0 which we could also write as mu sub s equals mu sub c. Those are mathematically equivalent, as I, I mentioned before. If you just add the mu sub c to, um, to both sides of the equation, it moves over to the, other, to the right. And then our alternative is going to be what? What should that be here? We're just saying, is there a difference? We're not saying that one of them should increase or decrease, and because of that, we're going to have a not equal to sign. And these are our null and alternative hypotheses. Note you only have to write either you know set one or set two. You don't have to write them both. If one of them makes it easier for you to conceptualize, please by all means go ahead and do that. I think the set one, the ones on the uh, left, are going to be helpful when we start talking about actually writing and calculating test statistics, but either one that helps you, go with that one. They're, they're equivalent. So how do we find the p-value in stat key? So let's go back to stat key. So here we are in stat key. Now we're, we're looking for a randomization hypothesis test, so we're in the rightmost column. We know we're looking for a test for difference in means, so we'll click that. And first thing we need to do is find our data set. So we're going to click where it says leniency and smiles. And we're going to find sleep caffeine words. And we're going to see here that we have the caffeine mean is going to be this group one. I mean, not caffeine mean, excuse me. The caffeine group is going to be group one. S sorry, I said that wrong. The sleep group is group one. And the caffeine group is group two. And we see that the mean for the sleep group is 15.25, and the mean for the caffeine group is 12.25. Their difference in means is 3, which is shown above. And we see that there are 12 subjects in each group. And so what we'll do is we'll generate a randomization uh, distribution for the difference in these means. 
So before I do that, one thing you may be wondering is, well, how do you actually create a randomization uh, sample? So in the situation where we're looking at a proportion, we could just flip a penny, right? We could conceptualize it as flipping a penny. But, but what is, how is this going to work in the situation where um, we have two separate groups and we're trying to look at the means? Well, in this situation, uh, and we'll learn about this in more detail, I think in section 4.5 in your text is where they cover it. Maybe it's, maybe it's, I think it is 4.5. Ultimately, what we're going to do is we're going to put, say, both the sleep and caffeine groups together into a, a into like a hat. And we're going to label 20 of the tags, uh, um, sorry, we're going to put the sleep and the caffeine people into a hat. And we're gonna and we're gonna pull out the first 12. We're gonna assign to a caffeine group, and then the next 12 will assign to the sleep group. And by doing this, we're essentially randomizing the label of caffeine and sleep, so that any differences that we might observe between the two are going to just be occurring by randomness. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. And I don't want to spend too much time going on this digression. I'm happy to talk about this in class too. So we'll generate 10,000 samples. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we've done this now. So the first thing we need to do is we need to determine, and, and note that this is centered at zero. If you look up here, we see that the mean is 0 0.028. That's approximately zero. And it's bell-shaped, which is going to have importance later on. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to determine what kind of a test do we have. A left tail test, a right tail test, or a two tail test. Well, our alternative was a not equal to sign, so it's two tail. And our sample mean is what we need to put in for the value down here. And so where it says 2.833 on the right, we should put in the value of 3. And then click OK and hit Enter. And so we're seeing that that value is 0 0.025. And so and this should, um, oops, sorry. So our p-value is going to be 0 0.025 times 2. Our p-value is going to be 0 0.05. So how do we interpret that? We say, given that the null hypothesis is true, the probability of observing a difference in uh, the probability of observing a statistic as extreme or more than that observed is 0 0.05. Within the context of the problem, which is how I want you to interpret it and how I expect you'll interpret it on the quizzes, given that there is no difference in the mean number of words recalled between people in the sleep condition and people in the caffeine condition, the probability of observing a difference in means as extreme or more than 3 is 0 0.05. So we'll do one more and then we'll, um, we'll be done for the day. Do women play less video games than men? A Pew Research study, con uh, this should not be there, Conduct that's a footnote. Conducted in July 2015, asked 2001 U.S. adults whether they play video games on a computer, TV, gaming console, or portable device like a cell phone. In the sample, 501 of the 1,000 males and 477 of the 1,001 females said they play video games. Does this provide evidence that the proportion of women that play video games is less than men? What are the parameter and statistic of interest? What are the null and alternative hypotheses? Find the p-value in stat key. So we know we want to look at the, uh, where we, we know we have two proportions, 0 0.501 over 1,000, 0 0.47, I mean 477 divided by 1,001. And we know we're told proportions here. So we know we're going to be looking at a difference in proportions. The other way to think about this is that we have um, two categorical variables, um, biological sex, male, female. And then the other variable is going to be, do you play video games? Yes, no. So that's two categorical variables. And we've learned that when you have two categorical variables, you're looking at a difference in proportions. So our parameters are going to be 
proportion of females and pro minus proportion of males. And our statistic of interest will be um, p hat of f minus p hat sub m. So what are the null and alternatives here? It's going to be p f minus p m, p f minus p m. And we know in the situation of above, that's no difference. So it should be equal to zero. And almost always, and I probably in all of our examples we're going to use in this case, I mean in this class, any difference in means or difference in proportions, we're likely saying, is there a difference versus is there not a difference? So the null hypothesis value will be zero. So below here it says, does this provide evidence that the proportion of females that play video games is less than men? So in other words, we'd expect this value to be less than zero. And that is because we're doing the proportion of females minus the proportion of males. If the proportion of females at play is less than the proportion of men, if we're doing the subtraction in that direction, that value will be less than zero. And we can also rewrite these like this. So now we want to find the p-value and stat key. And hopefully stat key uses this directionality um, for doing this. And I think they will because we have to enter the data in. So we come back to stat key. We're again in randomization hypothesis test. We're doing a test for difference in proportions. Here we're going to edit our data. For our first group, we should make it female. So we'll do 477 over 1001. And for group two, it was 501. That's going to be males over 1000. Great. We see we've entered this incorrectly. I mean, we've entered, not incorrectly, we've entered this in correctly. And so we can see group one is our females and group two is our males. And we have our difference in proportions of negative 0.024. So let's go ahead again and generate a bootstrap distribution. I mean, a randomization distribution. Um, one thing to think about is, again, we could kind of consider this the situation where it's like we could put everybody all um all 2001 of these people into a hat and randomly assign them a sex a male or female and then we've put 1001 of them into the female group 1000 into the male group group we calculate the proportion of each of those two groups that um, play video games and because we've randomly assigned their sex any difference we would expect would occur just by random chance alone that's how we can create our randomization distribution. So let's generate 10,000 samples. We'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the good thing is that we've set this up the same way that I set up my original um, null and alternative hypotheses. So our alternative hypothesis said that the, the proportion of females was less than the proportion of males. So we know we want to do a left tail test. Okay, great. We're almost there. Now what we want to do is we want to change this bottom value from negative point four two, I mean negative point zero four two, to negative point zero two four. Our sample difference in proportions. Click OK and hit Enter, and we see our p value is point one four two. So. Given that the null hypothesis is true, the probability of observing a statistic as extreme or more than that observed is 0.142. In the context of the problem, given that there is no difference in the proportion of females and males that play video games, the probability of observing a difference in means of negative 0.024 is 0.142, or 14.2%. So next time, what we're going to do is we're going to try to get a sense of, well, is 14 is 0.142, is that big or is that small? Hopefully you already have some sort of intuitive sense as far as whether or not you think that that's big or small, but that's really what we're going to be talking about next time when we start talking about a concept called statistical significance. Like always, if you have any questions, please come to class with them or to feel free to send me an email. Have a great day.